Okay, good evening, everyone who's just joined us. We're officially gonna get started. Welcome to this evening's Community Information Center on the Virginia Range Horses. My name is Erica Olson, I'll be your facilitator today. Thanks for being here. And I'd like to ask Council Member Dewar and, and Commissioner Lucy to kick us off. Good evening, everyone. My name is Naomi Dewar. I'm a Reno City Council Member for Ward 2, which covers from about Moana all the way down to the south end of Reno, including Mount Rose Highway. I've been looking at and working with the wild horse issues in the Virginia range for about six or seven years. And a lot has happened and a lot still needs to happen. Um, we decided as we looked at it internally and amongst various agencies that we wanted to really share some ideas with the public about where we are at this time. We've heard from you. I've gotten a lot of letters, messages, and calls about the issues. And we've done a lot, and we're gonna go over that a little later today, this morning, excuse me, tonight. Uh, but we really wanted to hear from you. We wanna share information, but we also wanna gather information. Um, while we're welcoming everyone, I just wanted to do a, a shout out. I understand Assemblyman Jim Willer may be joining us this evening. So if you're out there, Jim, welcome. And I also wanted to thank the media partners that are out there today. It's so important um, to get messages out, accurate information to our public about what we're doing and what is going on, accurate real-time data. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, we have a lot to cover tonight. We're gonna talk about actions, uh, proposed ideas, and a review of what's been going on. And so with that, again, welcome, and I'll hand it right over to Commissioner Lucy, who is here with us this evening. Councilman Dewar, thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate your time and, and participation this evening. Obviously, as Councilman Dewar, who has been working tirelessly on this issue, um, we're here to talk about the Virginia Range horses and the impact that they have to our community and the impact that we have on them. And so it's my honor to have to be here tonight. For those of you who have not, I haven't had the chance to meet. My name is Bob Lucy. I represent uh, the Washoe, Washoe County Commission and County Commission District 2. And that's everything from the uh, Truckee River south along the Virginia Range to Carson City. So... These issues are widespread and very impactful to our community. Um, and as we he are here today, I also brought along with me our assistant county manager, Dave Solero, who is also a resident of the South Meadows area and, and understands these issues tremendously. And we will be able to do, answer as many questions as possible throughout the session tonight. I wanna, I, we're proud to be part of this conversation. Um, I'm here, obviously here representing Washoe County, but we're excited that um, the city of Reno has invited us to participate, um, that NDOT is here tonight, the Wild Horse Connection and the Wild Horse Campaign. And so as we continue to hear your concerns, have a, uh, a frank conversation about the issues at hand, um, we're looking forward to trying to find some solutions. So thank you all for being here tonight. And with that, I'll turn it back to Ms. Olson. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, and thanks everyone. We've got about 140 participants as I can see right now. Um, let's just jump in and talk about how we're gonna spend our time this evening. Um, as mentioned by Council Member Dewar and Commissioner Lucy, this is a joint community information meeting with uh, representatives from City of Reno, Washoe County, uh, Nevada Department of Transportation, Wild Horse Connection and the Wild Horse Campaign. You saw some um, folks on camera just now. We'll bring them back in. They will be our panelists. We've got quite a wide range of topics to talk about today and good perspective to help work through um, sharing information as well as um, generating some ideas. So that's who's here. Just to really ground us to the purpose of today um, is about discussing community informed solutions to reduce accidents between vehicles and horses. There are a lot of other um, important issues that are broader than this, as well as sister issues to this as well. We are going to prioritize talking about um, safety uh, with an understanding that, you know, we'll hear a lot more than just that. So just kind of keep that in mind um, as we're working through. 
Uh, my role, I will be responsible for moderating and, and managing Q&A um, between all the sources. I'll talk about that in just a quick second. I would ask from all of you, um, if you would like to uh, have your voice heard, ask a question, provide your perspective, share a proposed solution, just be concise and, um, and use the available channels um, that we'll have for you. And I'll talk about that in a minute. You noticed when we came on, um, the meeting's being recorded. Um, so uh, you saw that as well as all chat and live comments. We will certainly post um, the recorded video um, as well. And we'll show you where that is uh, later uh, in, our, in our conversation today. Here's how we're gonna spend our time. Um, just taking a couple of minutes to talk about how we're working together today. That's, that's the first five minutes. We've got about 30 minutes of, of presentation to really uh, ground everyone on the current state. Councilmember Dewar will do that. Uh, we'll hear an overview of range management um, from Karina Vance, the president of Wild Horse Connection. We'll hear about fertility uh, from Tracy Wilson. Um, she's a special uh, projects coordinator and volunteer. Um, and then we'll hear about the fencing plan and some ideas around that uh, from John uh, Flansburg from City of Reno and Devin Cartwright from NDOT. And then we're gonna, we wanna spend about 90 minutes um, in Q&A. Uh, please note, we are uh, slated to try to wrap this up around 7.30, so just know that's where we're headed. So just foreshadowing, I know you're going to have um, some questions uh, for uh, the panel, as well as want to know how to ask questions as we're going through. So here's who's on the panel. Um, um, you heard reference to this, just want to mention um, a few folks I haven't mentioned already, um, representatives from the Reno Police Department, as well as Washoe County Sheriff's. Again, we'll do official uh, introductions when we get there, but just to know who's here with us today to answer your questions and share some ideas. So how do you participate in q and I just wanna give you a couple of key points on that. Number one is if you would like to live verbally ask a question, please raise your hand. There's a hand um, function in the lower, uh, lower Zoom panel. We're probably used to this, but just in case, that's how you get in queue, so you get in line. Um, and we will be taking um, folks in order as your hand was raised. So um, that's how you, um, at, you know, raise your hand to, to uh, get in line to ask a, a verbal live question. If you like to type in a question, there's a Q&A box. You can see that at the bottom. Um, so you can submit your question there. There's kind of a cool function, which is you can actually vote up a question that somebody else, um, somebody else has asked. So you might look at the other questions that have been asked before you add yours, because we will be taking those that have the most upvotes so we can address as many wide um, ranging um, asks as possible. So that's how you ask questions uh, with the Q&A. And then also if you pre-submitted a question, we will be using those as well. We have all of those. So we will be alternating between those three channels. So please be concise, please be considerate and respectful. We appreciate your input about the issues and not individuals. Um, listen and also be heard. So those are some of the rules of engagement we would just ask uh, for your, uh, your consideration. And then lastly, we will absolutely not get to all questions. I can guarantee that right now. There's a lot of ground to cover. We will uh, answer additional questions. We'll put them on the parking lot. We'll answer them in the future. We also don't have answers to all of the questions. So let's allow for that as well. Uh, we'll use the parking lot for that too. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Council Member Dewar. She's our first presenter. presenter. She'll give us an overview of the current state. All right. Let's see. Can folks see my screen? Um, Erica, give me a heads up. Yes, All we right. can. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, welcome. I, um, I also wanted to introduce uh, a person who's been very critical to setting up this entire event, and that is Jackie Bryant. She's our assistant city manager. She's uh, uh, passionate about horses herself, so she's the perfect person to help us with this project. So we're gonna just talk a little bit right now about the Virginia Range horses, past, present, and future. Okay. Okay, it's a roll. Um, first, a bit about the Virginia range. Um, you can see that it is big and it is generally bounded as far as the horses are concerned by I-80, 95A, which is on the east side, US-50 on the south, 395 on the, on the uh, west. 
And it covers all of these towns, Reno, Trick, et cetera, all the way through Washoe Valley and Carson City. We're gonna to focus today on the South Reno, Geiger grade toll road areas. Those are the areas that uh, the city and the county cover. So where is this place? It's probably a lot bigger than what you were thinking. Um, this is a, a map that shows the extent of the Virginia range. It's about 280,000 acres. And I have put a circle in the area that we'll be talking about today, um, right over here, and I'm moving my cursor around it too. For those of you familiar with Reno, this is McCarran, uh, Longley, and right here is Geiger Grade coming up into Virginia City. So the area we're gonna be talking about is basically east of uh, McCarran and um, east, obviously, of 395, and it crosses over Geiger Grade. I want to point out that the gray area is privately owned land. So the, the majority of land in the area is privately owned. The area is in yellow, some in checkerboard up here, and some uh, more contiguous down by Virginia City are managed by the BLM. Many, there are other types of ownership here too. The Bureau of RAC, the U.S. Forest Service has some land and some is a state park over by Washoe Lake. But you can get a sense of the area we're talking about, a small section of where the horses are. What does this place look like? Well, I've just put up a few pictures. Uh, you may not have had the chance, but people have seen bighorn sheep up there, golden eagles, and of course horses, and a wide variety of vegetation, everything from sagebrush and rabbit brush to trees like pinyon pine, juniper, and native grasses. But there is also invasive grasses like cheatgrass. When fires come in, often if it's not revegetated, invasive grasses come in. Interestingly, when in its young stage, horses will actually eat these invasive grasses. So as this development pressure grows, and we've seen tremendous growth in South Reno, the habitat for wildlife is reduced, access to water sources often blocked, and it becomes problematic for any animals, horses and all. The thing is that people just love to walk, hike, run, and bike in this area, but we just looked at the map that showed 90 to 95%, in fact, in this area is privately owned and subject to development. A little background on the horses. So horses have existed in Nevada for thousands of years. Some think the horses came to this area from Mexico or Spain or the Siberian land bridge, but they've also found fossils that are 30,000 years old in Nevada, Arizona, and Utah of horse fossils. Whether they're identical genetically, we don't know. That's why there's ongoing studies about the origin and timing of appearance of the horses. In general, the BLM manages the wild horses in Nevada. And interestingly, there are about 86,000 wild horses in America. Half of them, about 43,000, are in Nevada. And of that, 3,000 of the 43,000 are here in the Virginia Range. So what is special about these horses? Well, first of all, um, they are designated as estray or feral. Um, or Virginia Range horses, the term we'll use here. They're managed by the Nevada Department of Agriculture, and they have entered into a cooperative agreement with Wild Horse Connection to be their on-site manager. It's an annual agreement, and they'll go into it a little bit later. The theory is that the Virginia Range horses were originally domesticated horses that were released from one or more ranches, maybe 120 years ago from ranches along the Truckee River, there's no definitive data on this. I've, I've heard it presented, I've heard it discussed, but I haven't really seen the historic recording of that. Another theory is that these horses that were released interbred with other wild horses in Nevada. And what is known is that they're virtually indistinguishable on a genetic basis. So I mentioned Wild Horse Connection, American Wild Horse. They're doing two basically different jobs. I mentioned that about three years ago, um, the Nevada Department of Agriculture entered into an agreement with this nonprofit organization to be the manager. And so one takeaway from this meeting is that when the NDA, Department of Agriculture, gets calls about the Virginia Range horses, they are forwarded to Wild Horse Connection for response. They do like to be called if you um, see illegal feeding, but virtually everything else, and I would encourage you to call Wild Horse Connection for that as well. But 
it's really, you'll be provided a number later in this meeting uh, on who to call if you've got a question or concern, you see horses where they are not supposed to be, um, those are the folks. The American Wild Horse Campaign is focused on fertility control, and they'll be giving us a presentation a little later on what they do. So in terms of some of the critical issues, I've, I've put a picture up here of South Reno, and you really get the picture that it is pretty packed out and almost fully developed down there. And we also have horses in the street. In fact, South Reno has been the fastest growing area in Reno. We've added about 15,000 people and cars in the last 10 years. And what's happened is the development over time has displaced horses as well as other wildlife from this natural habitat. The thing is that the horses are attracted. You see uh, green space here and water. Uh, they are attracted to that. And what happens too is that people love horses and they say, well, I'm going to go out and give the horses a snack, a carrot, an apple, uh, some different kind of hay. And you'll hear later, that's really not a good idea and why. One of our biggest issues in South Reno is vandalism, vandalism of gates and fences. Whenever those gates are left open or mowed down or fences are cut, it provides a way for the horses to come off the range down into the development. It has been a constant um, feature of the issue. What happens is the Wild Horse Connection comes to the rescue and they try to patch that hole if they find out about it. They only usually find out about it after a horse has gone through. Speed on dark south Reno roads is also problematic. We've done some data analysis and found out that about 95% of the horse collisions occur at night. In the last three years, in fact, 25 horse collisions have occurred in South Reno Geiger grade toll road area and unfortunately, 88% were either killed or euthanized. That's 21 of the 25. Often, these collisions obviously end with death of a horse, a totaled car. I've yet to see, um, I've seen injuries, but I haven't seen anyone die yet. And often, very stressed people because anyone knows who's hit a large something on a road it is very traumatic for a driver. An example that I was just speaking about, um, gates being torn down, we have the example of Rio Wrangler Gate. For six, seven years, um, I have been working on this gate along with the uh, nonprofits, and it is a continual problem. I've circled here uh, the general area of the gate, and let's see if I can go back. Um, it's, it's actually right in here. And it usually has a pretty good looking gate. However, recently the entire gate was smashed. A uh, truck and trailer were left on site. Uh, the, the truck tore out the bottom, gas was everywhere in this area. Sometimes people don't see it. Sometimes they may be under the influence. And here is what it looks like now with the, the sort of patched together gate that's crossing half the width of the area. So let's take a deeper dive in these horse vehicle collisions. I've just put up some of the data. The blue line represents 2019 data. And this is a 25, this is 20, this is 15. So you can see how in different areas, Dayton Valley, the Tahoe Regional, or sorry, Tahoe Reno Industrial Complex or Center, South Reno and the Virginia Highlands. What's interesting is in Dayton Valley and Trick, the horse deaths have been going down. The impacts have been going down. And there's reasons for that. They have been started doing diversionary feeding in 2020, which is the orange bar. They started and you can see how much it dropped in the trick area. While we've been doing diversionary feeding in South Reno, there are so many people here that the collisions have actually shot up. And I mentioned how what it looks like, uh, the percentages of horses that actually end up being killed or euthanized after a horse hit with a car. I put a little bit more detailed data. Um, the main purpose of this slide is to say where we see diversionary feeding, such as Dayton Valley, um, and we it's had some of the uh, most significant number of hits. After diversionary feeding started, the collisions have gone way down. The purpose of diversionary feeding is to pull the horses away from congested areas. Same thing out at Trick going from 16 down to one in 2021. Unfortunately, in South Reno, we've been doing the opposite. We've been going up despite the diversionary feeding. And that is because we have very incomplete fences. 
Um, and that's at least what we believe. And the fences continue to be cut. Where there are fences, you can see these other areas that data has been collected on Washoe Valley, Silver Springs, Lockwood, et cetera, where there's wildlife fencing, the collisions tend to be lower. So what have we already been doing? Well, we have lowered speed limits on Rio Wrangler and Steamboat from 45 miles an hour to 35. We've added signs that remind people to comply with Nevada law, which is do not feed the horses, that it's unlawful. And it's also unlawful to harass horses, to chase them or to hurt them. We've added flashing signs um, with warnings such as horses on road. We've added eight new standard conditions to our permits uh, regarding, for example, if a new development's going in, they need to be fully fenced and they need to have operational gates and they need to repair those if they break within 48 hours. Eight standard conditions about a year ago. And we've begun to work with agencies and landowners to develop two things. One is a recreation wildlife corridor. So somehow people need to get through uh, where the developments are going, as well as the concept of a wildlife preserve. So there is actions underway. Um, we have been working with the nonprofits to secure the Rio Wrangler gate. Um, we're also looking at the possibility of installing cameras. I've been bringing this up. We need to know who is breaking down this gate. Uh, we are looking at a speed study, which is underway right now on South Veterans Parkway, evaluating speeds and seeing what are, uh, a good speed would be for that area, given all the obstacles, the horses, children walking, et cetera. We're looking at more frequent police patrols and evaluating if that's a possibility, especially where we get vandalism or fire set up in the hills, let's say by kids celebrating some event is usually what it is. We're improving our educational signage. We're actually looking at um, having a period of time where if people continue to feed the horses, we may at the city of Reno adopt the same law that the, the state has adopted and then give a grace period and then move in with enforcement and fines. It's such a serious problem. The only people that should be feeding are the ones who are authorized under contract with NDA, again, the Nevada Department of Agriculture. We're also looking at maybe improving our permit conditions for new developments. Starting January 1, the Nevada uh, Department of Wildlife started to review our condition, our permits that are occurring at the edges where urban meets wild lands to look at what are the impacts to all wildlife. So we may be amending our conditions. And then something that is underway right now is taking a closer look at those permits and seeing if we need to do better enforcement. For example, the fencing condition. If people aren't doing it, we need to have a conversation and make sure they do do it. The big takeaway today is that uh, are my next two slides and then I'm pretty much wrapping up. We have proposed, uh, in fact, the nonprofits have come to us and many people, I've received many letters proposing that we do additional fencing. And I have a picture right here of what that fencing looks like. It's typically a four strand uh, wire, uh, the bottom strand a foot off the ground. Uh, and we're looking at an area where we would do this fencing. And the concept I've already showed you is where there's fencing to keep horses away from people, it tends to work unless this fence is cut. And I would then ask every single person on this to help be our eyes and ears. If you see cut fences, report it. If you see people cutting fences or breaking down gates, you need to call that in as well. Additionally, there are many places where roads would cross a fence. And I've put a picture down here of a gate with a horse guard. And that's the kind of activity we're also looking at. And then in the midterm, um, we have talked with NDOT about the possibility of installing an overpass or an underpass on Geiger grade. Um, they have done it successfully in other places in Nevada and um, they, are, they brought it to us. They said, we think this would be a good place to do that. Um, we're also looking at setting up a wildlife preserve that would be um, available for all wildlife in this general area. Again, as we build, we are pushing um, all types of wildlife away, including horses. Uh, and yet these horses need to drink. Longer term, we're looking at that outdoor recreational and wildlife corridor. And I'm gonna remind you, all of the land that people love to walk along on the Virginia Range, next to the developments from Double Diamond, Damani Ranch, Curdy Ranch, everything to the east, you can assume it's private land. And yet people love to walk there, hike, bike, run. And so what we wanna do is provide a way for them to do that legally. 
so they're not trespassing over people's lands. Um, and that wraps up my presentation. Upcoming next is the Wild Horse Connection with Karina Vance, followed by American Wild Horse. And then you'll be hearing uh, something about the proposed fencing program. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Erica. I'm handing it over to Karina. Hi, my name is Karina. I am the president of Wild Horse Connection. We are an all volunteer 501c3 that is making a difference for the Virginia range wild horses. We are purely funded on donations and we have no paid employees. Wild Horse Connection works with the Nevada Department of Agriculture under a cooperative agreement to manage the Virginia range horses for public safety and herd health. We work with the city, county, law enforcement, businesses, developers, and loan landowners to develop collaborative solutions to help keep horses living wild out on the range while reducing horse hum human conflict. In 2021 um, alone from Washoe Valley to Hidden Valley, we received 436 calls. 80% of those calls came from the community members. 20% came in from the NDA or law enforcement. We work on fencing gates, cattle guards to prevent horses from accessing roadways. Volunteers have installed and repaired fencing, installed and repaired gates, and cleaned out cattle guards. Nevada is a fence out state by law. Diversionary feeding is only approved by the NDA in certain locations to help draw horses away from the streets and neighborhoods, reducing vehicle strikes and conflict. Dayton Valley strikes dropped 68%. USA Parkway stri strikes dropped 94% down to one. We partner with LRTC's fully certified technical large animal emergency rescue team. They help us with injured horses, horses that need to be moved on foot, horses that need to be relocated to safer areas by trailer, orphan foals, and more. We also care and provide adoption of those that needed to be removed from the range. Community education, we educate on safety issues, laws regarding feeding, respecting all wildlife, driving safely in wild horse areas. We worked with the city of Reno for fencing conditions for the new developments. Ongoing projects include solutions for a healthy range, water access for all wildlife, high range seating possibilities, collaborative fencing solutions to identify horse migration patterns and appropriate locations of range fencing, gates, cattle guards to protect public and horse safety. The Virginia range horses are the very horses that Wild Horse Annie, AKA Velma Braun Johnson fought to protect in the 1950s, resulting in the Wild and Free Roaming Horse and Burroughs Act of 1971. And all good things are wild and free. I'm gonna turn this over to Tracy with American Wild Horse Campaign, thank you. Good evening, I am Tracy Wilson. I am a volunteer with Wild Horse Connection and I am a volunteer and assistant supervisor for the Large Animal Emergency Rescue Team. I'm also a special projects coordinator with American Wild Horse Campaign and I'm gonna to talk to you about the fertility control program that we are now in our third year on the range. Um, it is a humane population management program. We use a non-hormonal immunocontraceptive vaccine that is delivered to mares via remote darting. It's backed by 30 plus years of science and it's about 97% effective when administered correctly. The main goal obviously is to reduce population growth, which increases the health of the horses, reduces horse and human conflicts and improves the range ecology. To expand on those goals, 
We want healthy horses, a healthy range, reduced conflict. We want to educate the, on the historical and cultural importance of the Virginia range herd. And we want to keep wild horses wild. How do we implement this program? Our volunteers are trained and certified through a PZP certification class offered by the Science and Conservation Center. They're trained to go out and identify, dart and document every individual horse on the range. They team up in darter documenter pairs to go out and gather data and vaccinate those mares. The, the dart itself is delivered remotely via an air powered rifle. Uh, most horses react by taking a few steps and settling right back into their grazing with pretty minimal disturbance. That dart's designed to go in and pop right back out where it's retrieved by the darter. We have a range-wide database that tracks each individual horse on our range. They're identified by the area they're in, color, gender, individual markings. Every fertility control treatment is tracked for every mare. Um, our darters work within this database. They're updating it constantly. They're out on the range all the time. We, this program was actually made possible through a cooperative agreement um, with the Nevada Department of Agriculture. It comes at no cost to the taxpayers. It's funded by donations and grants. It was restarted in April 19 with support from Governor Sisolak, Assemblyman Jim Wheeler, Blockchains LLC. We have ongoing support for this program from Tahoe Reno Industrial Center, individual businesses and corporations, five local wild horse advocacy groups, uh, a wide network of private property owners who allow us permission to come onto their property to do this implementation. And we have broad community support. Polling shows 86% of Nevadans believe wild horses are an important symbol that they wanna see protected on the range. So what are our successes to date? As of the end of 2021, we had, uh, in 2021, we had 243 fewer foals born that was a 43% reduction in births. Of those that were born, we have about a 46% full mortality rate on the range. Uh, we do have predation on our range and young horses are our prey. Uh, we have treated since this program began in April of 2019, 1,644 individual mares. We've halted population growth and we expect to see population decrease over the next few years. We have also partnered in a, a kind of an exciting project with the University of Pretoria in South Africa to analyze our data on this program. They have experience with elephant PZP programs. Um, they'll not only help us improve how we implement the program here, but also help us establish PZP as a humane management tool that can be used with other wild horse herds across the West. Um, horses have existed on the Virginia range for a century. They're part of the culture and history of our area and of the West. It's our responsibility to manage and care for them and all wildlife humanely. This includes for us the fertility control program, the range management program, the multiple wild horse organizations that support these programs, the community support, the thoughtful development within the city and counties, um, strategic fencing, community education, and collaborative solutions. We can coexist not only with the horses, but with all wildlife on the Virginia range. I encourage you if you have questions about the fertility control program to go to AmericanWildHorseCampaign.org. If you have questions that aren't answered there, you can email us or there's a contact form there on that page. And with that, I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna turn it over to John Flansburg. And just as a process check, everyone, we just have about three more minutes worth of briefing to provide. And then Assemblyman Wheeler, I see your hands up and we'll jump into Q&A. So John and Devin, just give us a, a share on the thoughts related to fencing. All right, thank you everyone. <clears throat> um, tonight, uh, you know, obviously uh, Council Member Durer and, there's, and, and all of the presentations, there's just not a lot of information. And going back to the, looking at the vehicle and, and, and animal collisions, just want to reiterate that safety is our top concern. And that's the public safety and safety for horses and other wildlife. Tonight, we're here to seek input from the public on how best to accomplish this goal. Working as individual agencies, we stay within our boundaries. We use tools like fencing within our right-of-ways. 
or installing cattle guards or horse guards. The results, frankly, can lead to incomplete solutions. We may solve an immediate concern in one area, but push the problem somewhere else. And the solutions can be costly. Tonight, we have representatives from the Department, Nevada Department of Transportation, Washoe County and City of Reno. We have agreed to work together to listen to the public and our partners, to remove boundaries and seeking solutions to see if a regional solution can be more effective, uniform in its application, and have a lower cost than all of the combined individual solutions. Devin Cartwright with Nevada Department of Transportation and Dave Solero with Washoe County are here to work on this as partners. Specifically, we did receive one conceptual fencing plan, and, and this came from the American Wild Horse Campaign that Tracy, who just presented, um, just provided, you know, looking at a sketch. So, that, so nothing has been vetted out on this, certainly. It's, it's conceptual in its proposal to us, but it gives an idea to say, you know, potentially using fencing, and instead of just using right away along our roadways um, and, and our boundaries, our county or city boundaries, if we looked at putting in a solution, maybe perhaps like this, where we're following um, the areas that where we want to fence in or fence out, um, as Karina had mentioned, uh, maybe something looks like this. We don't know what it's going to look like on the ground, and, and there's going to be a lot of work that's going to need to be accomplished as we, um, if this is a solution going forward. But we also want to hear your solutions. And so that's why we're here tonight, and we look forward to this opportunity for questions and answers and to get the input and also the follow-up that comes after this meeting. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and turn the time back over to Erica. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to all of our uh, presenters. Again, the purpose of that was just to quickly get everybody on the same page about what has happened, what's being contemplated, some ideas that are in the mix. Lots of questions in chat, I see that right now. Um, I also see that Assemblyman Wheeler uh, is with us in the panel and you have your hand up. So I think we'll just start there. Sir, if you would um, unmute yourself and, and jump on in and, and um, take it away. Well, thank you, Eric, I appreciate it. Uh, can't seem to start the video, but apparently I've got the mute undone, so I'm good there. But um, I did want to uh, ask a couple questions. We had a Zoom meeting much like this in uh, uh, last March, which I thank you for very much. And during that, we were talking about, I think, uh, Naomi, you were talking about um, a study to go on about the speed limit and the horses coming down into uh, uh, the Veterans Park area. And I'm wondering what's happening with that study. I think you touched on it a little earlier, but I'd kind of like to know where it's at and what we're doing with it. And also the other thing is, I know we were thinking of, and again, you touched on this earlier, but uh, the, southern, the south or western part, whatever you want to call it, of a Veterans Parkway, I know the speed limit is still 55. And that's probably the worst part as far as where the horses go. So uh, you said in that last one that you were going to look into taking that down to 35. And right. one, one of the benefits of that that I can see is, like, for instance, me coming from Gardnerville, if I want to go out to Sparks and I put an address in my, uh, um, what do you call it, Google Maps, you know, it takes me up Veterans Parkway. So since it takes you the fastest way, I think if we lowered that limit for the, uh, at least the beginning part of that, back down to 35, that would remove a lot of the trucks, which are you know blind uh, spots basically for cars uh, versus horses, and bring the people back around up uh, 395, 80, and kind of remove some of the congestion down there at 55 miles an hour with no fencing. So I'm just kind of wondering where that's at for the moment. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. And I'm gonna, pull um, John Plansberg and also Dave Solero in. But the bottom line is that the county has completed, to my knowledge, a speed study on toll road. And the city of Reno is underway um, doing a speed study on Veterans Parkway right now. Um, John, anything to add or Dave? 
Yeah, I think just for the, the bigger picture, um, <coughs> did perform a speed study on the northern section of the uh, Veterans Parkway. This would be the portion that would be north of, um, of South, Meadows. South Meadows. And in that portion, um, we did raise the speed limit there to the 55. However, the portion that is south, uh, we are doing a speed study right now to determine what the correct speed is. And obviously, it's not an arbitrary process. There's a lot that goes into that analysis. We will, we will be finishing that up here in the next week, and then we'll be getting results out. Um, but okay, if John, if you, if you could, I'd really appreciate it uh, to get that to me through. Uh, I, uh, Jennifer Baker is my representative on the horse issues. And if we could get that through her, I believe she's actually on right now, but I don't, she's not on the panel. But uh, if we could get that through her, I'm sure Naomi can give you her contact. I can give you her contact. Bob can. Um, but if you get that to her, she's going to represent me on the, the horse thing. So right. I would really appreciate because I'm trying to run a campaign right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that the roads are very challenging. And we have seen that, you know, we always hear it. And we have several um, of our law enforcement officers. And, and they always have one message, which is speed kills. So it's it's true for people and it's true when it comes to animals. So Dave, do you do you want to add anything? Yeah, no, I just I just want to reiterate too that Washoe County is doing the same sort of thing along Toll Road. Uh, you know, we've got some speed study uh, uh, counters out right now, uh, just so that we understand. And so uh, you know, we'll we'll get that over to your office as well as soon as that's uh, that's taken care of. I appreciate the the comment. Much like John, we're we're doing what we need to do to, to make sure that we understand the speeds and, and really what that means for us out there, uh, because that is a that is a big deal. Uh, speeding, uh, you know, not just with wild horses, but speeding in general seems to be a, a problem within our community. Yeah, it's, it's definitely along that that area there. I travel it once in a while to go see the kids and, uh, you know, people are driving 75, 80 up on the 55 part. And if we can bring that area down where the horses are around the uh, southern end there you know, to the 35 zone, put the signs up for the horses, et cetera. Maybe we can, uh, Naomi was saying she's never seen anyone killed by horses. Go out to Highway 50 and ask uh, the Lyon County Sheriff's about their sheriff's deputy because there have been people killed out there on horses. Right. So it, it's, it's like hitting a moose. It's the same size. I have no doubt. I had a friend in a car hit a, a, a horse and that person died. Uh, excuse yeah. me, a cow and that person died. Yep. Um, I don't know if our police officers want to weigh in or our law enforcement, but uh, I think their message has been received by us that everyone, I mean, this is another huge takeaway from this meeting, no matter what, is just slow down in the, especially in the night. Yep. So let's grab, let's, um, let's officially get into Q&A and I'd love to have our panelists turn their cameras on and officially join us and Assemblyman Wheeler, if it's cool with you, I'm going to um, ask a couple more questions about speed. Um, and signage, because we're being asked a few more questions about that, unless there's anything else that um, you wanted to cover while your mic's off. Uh, the only thing that I had is I did see on the chat, someone asked what the NRS was, what the law was to not harass horses. I believe that's NRS 569, if you want to look it up, but I'm not positive. I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's NRS 569. I know I've dealt with the horse problem since... Uh, uh, 2013, when I originally passed the bill to not be able to feed horses within a mile of a road. So, and uh, that's one of the uh, uh, NRS sections that we use constantly on this. So I think it's in there for whoever asked that question. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, again, I'm going to just do a quick introduction of our panelists. Um, there's more names on the screen than our panelists because we have our meeting support here as well. So just really clearly, um, uh, Jackie Bryan, Assistant, Assistant City Manager, City of Reno. Jackie, give us a quick wave. Um, John, Flan, John Flansburg, uh, Public uh, Director of Public um, Public Works. Right, John? Awesome. Thank you, City of Reno. Um, Commander Sean Garlick, uh, also a Reno Police Department. Thank you for being here. Dave Solero, Assistant County Manager, Washoe County. Also with Washoe County is Captain Solfrino. Um, thank you for being here as well. With the Washoe County Sheriff's Office, Devin Cartwright. Uh, and dot um, Crane Advance, President of Wild Horse Connection, and Tracy Wilson, Special Projects Co Coordinator, American Wild Horse Campaign. So that is our official panel. So thank you all 
uh, for being here. I'm gonna ask a couple more questions about speeding if we could please. So there was a question in chat and I'm just, I'm just gonna stick on that topic and then we'll move to others watching the clock. Um, we wanted, to, um, some folks want to know a little bit more about the speed study. Is it safe to say that for the next community meeting, which we'll have one in the May timeframe, we'll have some um, solutions or recommendations based on that data? John? Yeah, Erica, that, that would be correct. We're, we're just finishing that up. In fact, they just pulled the counters today. Um, so uh, that the information will be gathered, uh, synthesized, and we'll, we should actually have something out within a week or two, but it'll certainly be ready for the next meeting. Awesome, thank you for that. A couple more questions and I'm taking some from the pre-submitted questions. I'm just reading from my, my other monitor over here. Um, how can we get flashing horse in the area signs on the Northern end of East Lake in Washoe Valley? Dave, I think that might be for you. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think the best way to do something like that uh, for the general public is to go ahead and, and give our office a call by dialing 311. Uh, or 775-328-2003. Uh, that gets you directly in with our, uh, basically our call center. And they are uh, really good at getting the information over to our traffic control committee who analyzes uh, those requests uh, against the traffic manuals. They work with the sheriff's office. They work with our roads crews who do all the maintenance uh, to make sure that we can find the most appropriate location and the most appropriate type of signage. And so I've actually got this one, uh, you know, I've just jotted myself a note, so I will make sure that this one gets in. But if you're, uh, you know, just a citizen in Washoe County and you're looking for something from, you know, understanding a little bit more about what's going on at Washoe County, uh, just dial 311. Uh, you can also email at washoe311 at washoecounty.gov. Awesome, Dave, thank you. A couple more, just gonna stay in this zone. Um, one more question that was pre-submitted, um, Council Member Dewar, I think this is for you. Can we do more public service announcements on TV to inform the public to slow down? That's a yes. And um, Jackie Bryan has initiated for the city of Reno a full year of outreach and information. And I am sure that public service announcements are going to be part of that as well as using social media. So that's a definite yes. Thank you so much. Um, I've got an upvoted question here um, from four folks. The speed limit near Curdy Ranch Maverick gas station um, is like driving on the Indy 500. There's a crosswalk near that Maverick. I've seen people nearly get hit. Can we get speed lowered there, please? Yeah, so I, I would just say that area is included in the speed study that the city of Reno is concluding. Awesome. Thank you so much. Just looking at any other speed specific questions. Okay, let's talk about fencing. Um, a lot of questions about fencing. I'm gonna take the, the top one at the top. Um, actually, let's, yeah, we'll go back to water in a quick second. So the, the one below that, um, the wild horses deserve to be in this area. They are native. It's what makes our area unique. Uh, what support does the city of Reno need to secure the fences and create the wild horse sanctuary to bring in tourism with this topic? Council Member Dewar, I think that's sure. got your name on I'll it. I'll take a stab. Um, you know, Mayor Cashel uh, was a visionary. And back in 2014, he actually uh, had a city proclamation passed, 2014, saying that he wanted to use the horses as one of our points of ecotourism. So, so this idea has been floating around for a while and actually the city has actually taken some action on it. Um, recently, myself and uh, Tracy Wilson have met with RTC to talk about are there opportunities, lands that have already been acquired so that as we, I think it's an important understanding that as we fence horses out, they still have to go somewhere. They have to eat somewhere. They have to get water somewhere. Their primary watering source before all this development was Steamboat Creek and the wet marshes that were around it. There aren't that many springs or creeks coming out of the Virginia range. I mean, there's one here or there. So it is something we're looking at. Um, I mean, if there's interest in it, I would love to hear that. Um, there may also be disinterest. Uh, I'm open to hearing uh, what people think. But what I have heard is that if we could set up a preserve and we could, um, and not just for horses, this would be for all wildlife. It would be very similar to the one that the city is working on now with Rosewood Lakes, where we're taking the golf course and we're trying to revegetate it 
and turn it back into more of a wetland park, wetland viewing area, to set up a um, platform where people could view horses, where signage or information exhibits, where they could learn about the horses, some of the information that we shared here tonight. Um, I think there's a demand for that, but we need to hear about it. So I think the best way is to, um, you know, obviously you're participating in this meeting, but we also need to hear about it probably in writing at the city um, would probably be the best way that I would recommend. Um, there's okay. one other thing while I have the mic, people asked about NRS and what controls and um, Assemblyman Wheeler was correct. And there's two other NRSs I think people should know. One is I mentioned unlawful to feed or harass wild horses. And that is NRS 504.490. And as he mentioned, NRS 569.040. So two different sections of NRS about unlawful to feed or harass. The other one that I think is very important for people to know, and especially if we get serious about the Rio Wrangler gate or any other gate, is that there's actually an NRS that, that requires uh, gates to be kept closed. It's sort of a, a concept of the West. When you're in the West, you, keep, you close a gate behind you. It's just, it's manners, but it's also the law. NRS 207.220, penalty for not closing gates, shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor. So these are both NRS laws that people should be aware of. Uh, we're not just talking here. So thank you. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for that. I'm going to keep us in the in the zone of fencing. Uh, no pun intended there. Uh, a lot of questions about over and underpasses. They're successful in other areas. Is this part of the plan? Is there advocacy on this point? Uh, what what What's the thought about that? So I think I'm going to ask John and Devin and, and Dave, I guess. Devin, go ahead. I'll take this one. So uh, just want to talk about that. NDOT's got a lot of experience with uh, wildlife uh, crossings in the state. We've got several overpasses uh, all over in the east for deer and other wildlife. And we actually have quite a few underpasses that we've uh, actually probably been the first in the world to utilize for horses. Um, it is something that we're going to evaluate with, a, with the group here. Um, and it's just something that's going to take some time. Uh, when we do evaluate for a crossing, uh, we need to look at right-of-way impacts and construction timelines. So uh, anticipating some right-of-way, uh, we would anticipate it to take uh, quite a few years, probably uh, at least two, two to three years to evaluate that process before we would see any kind of activity. And in an area like this that's so congested with private property, we would want to make sure that that's conducted and constructed as a part of a larger plan to ensure that uh, we didn't accidentally fence off either side of it and then make it ineffective. So that's why we're here to be a part of the team and find an effective collaborative solution so that we can all uh, enjoy the wild or the horses here. And you know, Erica, in the American Recovery Act or the ARPA uh, and in the infrastructure bill, maybe Tracy can speak to this. It sounds like there's actually a section that talks about making money available throughout the US for these under overpasses. Um, would you wanna to speak to that, Tracy? I don't have a lot of specific information. I know there's been a little delay in how that money is gonna be distributed, but yes, in the infrastructure bill, there is a designated section and there are set amounts per year, which is quite high um, for wildlife overpasses um, for, for, for different states to apply for those across the board. And, it, and it's, I think it's a five year program. It's a pilot program, five or six years. And there's a designated amount every year that they're gonna release for those. Okay. Uh, we'll put that on the list and kind of keep watching for that, right? The, the funding source is kind of a big deal for this. And people are asking about the cost. I think that would be part of the study. Um, as we're, again, I'm gonna stay in this zone and then I'll take some folks that are in queue. There's been a lot of questions here about water and considerations of water sources, adding ponds, um, how is that gonna get addressed? The fences are a good idea, but what about, what are we gonna do about water? You know, uh, I guess I'll take this one. I was the former state water planner for Nevada. So I got a lot of exposure to how the water law works um, and what it can and can't do. First of all, uh, you can appropriate water for wildlife. You can appropriate water for ranching. Um, both are, are allowable uses. Um, during the process of several developments coming in, I also serve on the Tumwa board, the Truckee Meadows Water Authority. 
we met with Tamwa to talk about can Tamwa allocate water for horses or other wildlife? And the answer was yes. Um, they have a category for that. So if someone constructs a tank and, and most of it, let's say, is for residents, but a portion of it might be used for wildlife or for horses, um, they have no problem with that. I mean, they've worked through those issues before. So I think it's a qualified yes in that, yes, it's lawful. Yes, it's allowed. The question becomes, is the place that you want to get water to near a population center if you want to get the water from Tumwa, you know, from a water provider? The other alternatives are to go natural, a la Steamboat Creek, to drill a well, to use a guzzler. My um, The research we've done on guzzlers is it may not produce enough water to water horses. It, it's often sufficient, let's say, out in the northern part of Nevada when you want to wa uh, water wildlife um, where they're experiencing impacts, um, you know, due to development. But so far, that hasn't been a thing. I showed a, a slide uh, many times, and I really think Tracy should talk about this or Karina, um, how you how you do water the wildlife using um, the the tires, you know, that we've discussed before. Yeah, we had um, actually found because as Councilwoman Doerr has pointed out, what we have a lot of problem with in our area is vandalism. So our concern on like a stock tank type watering system is if that gets destroyed, does it get shot up? Does the things get broken? Um, what we have found are some, they're basically large mining equipment tires and they get repurposed to hold water. It's got a cement base in it. And those are self-sealing. If they get shot up, they self-seal. So it reduces a lot of repair and replacement needed if something were to happen to it. It also, because it's made out of black rubber, it defrosts quickly in frozen weather where uh, metal will not. We get sunshine most of the time around here. So cold, we might freeze the water, but that absorption of the heat into the black rubber thaws it very quickly. Okay. So bottom okay. line, I'll just say this. Um, we've talked to developers. They haven't been too enthusiastic about it, I will say. I mean, they understand the issue, but they're not sure where to place these things on their property. Often the development is, um, the roads have to be built and the water tanks have to be built as part of building the development. The timing might be off for horse needs. Let's say they're blocking a source of water and they need water in the interim. Um, they don't have the road infrastructure to get or to build a tank. So that's the timing issue has been really challenging, which is again why I'm looking to a natural way. You know, just use the water that's already there in a place the horses and other wildlife have obtained it in them previously. Okay, let's stay, I'm just gonna stay in this zone for a minute longer. A lot of questions about lighting. So can we get some lighting? It's very dark to, you know, it's hard to, to see what it, and you know, there's also other considerations related to lighting. So I think I'm gonna ask John and Dave, I think that would be the right two folks to help us answer the questions related to lighting. Uh Thank you, Erica. Yeah, I, you know, the, the lighting, when, when the development goes in, there's a certain amount of lighting that, that happens with that development and the lighting up the roadways and obviously intersections. The difficulty is when it comes to the, the wild horse population, they just absorb the light. I mean, if, if you're out at night, you, it's just there, there's no, nothing shining off of them. We thought about it'd be great to get some sort of reflective jackets to put on the horses. Uh, something like that would might help, but um, uh, as far as getting additional lighting, we also have to consider the dark skies and and other initiatives that are out there. So there's there's a lot of competing factors with that. So um, you know, as we look at lighting, it is a potential solution in certain areas where we see a higher amount of of the horse you know crossings or areas that we might see that way. But also, if we can actually just fence off where the horses are getting down in to those areas that would that might be more effective so those are just some of the considerations that that we'll need to take a look at when it comes to lighting and john isn't it true that um the lights down in south reno are are either owned managed or by envy energy could you just speak to that for a minute yeah so in the city of reno uh prim primarily all of the traffic lights unless they're decorative lights in downtown or midtown or Wells Avenue, 
Uh, most of the lights in Reno are are owned and operated by NV Energy. We pay a, a, a fee to NV Energy for that for those lights. But but those when developers put them in, and then they they are owned by NV Energy, and and we just look to make sure they meet the standards that we have. And John, I have another question on that for you. Um, if a light is out, what do you recommend a resident do? Because what we want to do before we add more lights is make sure the lights we have are working. So what do you recommend there? Yeah, so if, if you ever come across the light that is that is out, um, either call uh, NV Energy Direct has a, uh, a, a, a location on their website, but you can also just call our Reno Direct uh, line and uh, submit that information. Uh, ideally, you have to go underneath the light, look straight up, and there's a, uh, um, a number on that light. And if, if you get that information, at least give us a location where it's at, but if you can get that number, that's even a better identifier and NV Energy will come out and share the light. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, I'm going to take, I'm going to ask um, Nick, if you would bring in the first person that's in queue, please. Um, that would be great. And, and while we're waiting, waiting for that individual to, to come in, um, there's a question specifically about, um, again, I'm still in the fencing zone. Um, controlling or keeping wild horses out of the Washoe Lake State Park equestrian area. And Dave, that might be for you or that might be for John. I'm sorry, Erica, would you mind repeating that? No problem. It was a little bit of a mouthful. Um, if there are any considerations to control or keep out wild horses at the Washoe Lake State Park equestrian area. That might not be your area. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I haven't heard about that, and I, you know, I think that certainly we could take that information and, and work with the state and, and discuss that. I mean, there's no, uh, as I understand, any plans yet. But certainly, if that's the information that we're getting from our our, our citizens, that that's an area we should look at, then we'll certainly uh, look at that. We'll work with uh, with Karina and her team and see what that looks like. So, thanks. Can we post that information to? Um, you're going to post, I think, Erica. The answers the, to the questions being asked right now, and we're going to put others in the parking lot. Maybe we could post the uh, contact information for state parks. And I think Devin Cartwright had offered to to talk that through as well. I think earlier. That's perfect. Yeah. So just just to cover the the Washoe Lake State Park is uh, operated by Nevada State Parks. So uh, we will post some information about how to get a hold of them. Awesome, thank you for that. And uh, as Selena Wheeler, I see your hands up. We'll go to you and then we'll go to the um, participant that joined us from the queue. Go ahead, sir. Well, thank you. I just wanted to comment on the uh, state park. The state park, that equestrian area that people are talking about there also includes the lake itself. And the animals do come down and cross East Lake and go to the lake itself for water in the summertime. So I think that would be a very, very hard thing to do. Uh, especially since it's an equestrian area with a whole lot of good feed for these animals. I think most people would like to actually see them stay there. I know I would. Thank you for that context. Mm. Yep. Okay. Cameron Green, you are our first live uh, person in queue. If you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and take the mic, please. Certainly, thanks for having me here. Um, I kind of present a different perspective, uh, I think, than what is a lot of uh, the opinion here. But I think the important part here is to to look at um, the 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 specific nature of South Reno and uh, not the entire Virginia range. I've, I've made some posts in the question and answers about the entire Virginia range, but specifically down here, the fencing is important. That's part of a multifaceted approach to what some people would call integrated pest management. And the first thing is exclusion, and that is fencing. And that is super important. But what's also important is making the habitat uh, less appealing to the animals that are creating a hazard. And in this case, it's the horses. And the additional hazards are created by their desire to get food and water that is in our city. And one of the things that we need to do is stop feeding them um, anywhere close to it. The diversionary feeding is occurring literally just a few hundred yards from, from where the horses are a problem. And it should be occurring a mile or two miles up onto that private property. Um, I, I think the next step there is looking at some sort of reasonable uh, means of 
uh, people getting the horses out of the area. Um, when we do integrated pest management, whether it's for small animals or large animals, you're going to use her means of harassment or hazing. And uh, Endow, for instance, does that with bears that are becoming uh, habituated to humans. They use rubber bullets. And certainly something like that would be uh, both humane and feasible to keep the horses out of the area, make it un un unappealing for them to be there. Uh, again, I know that that's somewhat of an unpopular opinion, but the fact is that it's just a matter of time, as Councilwoman Dewar said, that before somebody hits a horse and dies, because the, the, the reasonable speed limit of 45 miles per hour on Veterans Parkway is still something that could, could be a, a problem in an accident. And lastly, I'm just going to, um, I typed in the question, so it doesn't have to be answered now, but I want to ask uh, Commander Garlock. Uh, currently, there is already an NRS in place that allows Reno Police Department to enforce Nevada revised statutes. Um, I wrote the wrong statute in the q and I can't remember it off the top of my head, but um, it does seem that they could issue a citation for improper illegal feeding and uh, under NRS 569. So um, I would just ask that they probably need to have a quick policy procedure type update, maybe notify the city attorney's office and that they may be receiving citations for such violations. And then hopefully Commander Garlock would make sure that his officers would actually uh, be able to respond out. And um, the, the law does require one warning. And so they would have to document that much the way a trespass warning is. And then the second time they could issue a citation and anybody could sign, any, any person that uh, observed that violation could sign the, the citation. Uh, may I just respond to one thing? Um, Thank you so much, Cameron, for bringing up some of these points, especially this last point about the enforcement. We've talked internally, and I think we're going to try to start with the education campaign big. We already heard about, uh, could we put um, uh, public service announcements on TV? Yes. Can we use social media? Yes. I think our, our concept is to educate, um, even though there's signs, people are not uh, apparently even haven't gotten the message. Uh, we're looking at improving the signage and expanding the signage. But to your point, uh, we've definitely talked internally about then moving to a penalty phase. So I appreciate that. And then I would like to ask Tracy if she could just address the issue earlier about the feeding location. Um, I know that uh, there's uh, diversionary feeding and you said it was coming to an end and would be moving. Could you just address that? Yeah, actually, we're actually seeing across the range, several are several of our diversionary feeding areas, the horses are not even coming in. There's grass starting to sprout out there because of this weather we've had. Um, they're starting to disperse and we only do this during the late fall winter or well, the fall winter months when they're coming down to the streets. So that's gonna end shortly. Um, some of the sites will have to be moved to new locations next year because we do have restrictions on where we can feed um and those will have to be reassessed to see if they still meet requirements or get moved farther away from new development that's going in because there is so much new development along this part of the range let's um let's let's stay in range management if we can we'll go to that subject area if that answers your question council uh, council member doer that you were uh, it did. Tracy. thank you yes okay uh, erica can awesome I, um, so so Tracy, just a handful of questions here for, oh, please, Cameron, you're still with us. I'm sorry, go ahead. That's okay. I would just like to respond um, to a couple of the things in the Q&A. Um, like I said, I understand I have an unpopular, my opinion is the unpopular opinion in this meeting, but um, I think Tracy would actually uh, answer some of the questions for some of the people that are uh, posting in here. The horses are in fact an invasive species. The horses were in fact brought here by humans. Um, even Tracy's own uh, um, uh, presentation included that, that they've only been here about 100 years. So I think people really, they get enamored with the beauty of the horses, which I will too. They're beautiful creatures, but they are causing so much damage and they are so... Um, so resource intensive because they take those horses, the, the water and the, the other resources for actual wildlife, such as the bighorn sheep, the mule deer, the chucker, the sage grouse, everything else that are, that are native wildlife here. Thank you for thank, that. Thank you Thanks, for letting Cameron. me respond. You're welcome. Thanks for being with us. Um, we're gonna um, move to the next set of questions and we'll also go to the next person in queue in about one minute. 
So with that, I'd like to ask a couple of questions related to range management. Tracy, these are all for you. Let me know if there's anything funny with my audio. There's quite a few questions related to um, the, um, the, the, the population that the range can support. So if you could maybe just, just speak to that, please. Sure. Um, we did see a couple of the questions come in. Um, somebody mentioned, oh, the range can only support 600 horses. Um, people have asked how many can it support. So let me just go back to the 600 number or the four to 600 number or 500 or whatever number gets thrown around. Um, that actually came out of a study by the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, that's, they had a study area that they did and the report stated that 550 horses would be supported allowing for a 20% cheat grass. But the very next sentence in that study states that where the forage allocation for cheat grass is determined as by the forage allocation for perennial forage plants, the grazing capacity is estimated at 918. The key here is that that study area was 85,000 acres and this range is 280 plus thousand acres. So it's, it was taken out of context and used a lot. Um, does that mean we think that we should have 300 horses on the range? Well, not if it can't support it when you have increasing development. But as, as we start bringing the population numbers down, we can reach a point that their coexistence can happen, where the range can stay healthy, where the horses can stay healthy, where the bighorn sheep and the pronghorn antelope and the deer and everything else on our range can stay healthy. Um, we do have, you know, that as we saw in the presentation I gave earlier, we've already stabilized that population growth. We've halted the, the, the increase and are now looking at decrease going forward. Awesome. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, just a couple more questions on this and some of these are tough. So first of all, a lot of questions about why is the department, the Nevada Department of Agriculture not here? Aren't they accountable for the herd management? And they certainly are, but as why, we so let's clarify. Yeah, they certainly are. But as we described in both of the, the pre presentations, um, there are two cooperative agreements on the Virginia range that allow for wild horse connection to conduct range management um, and take on those responsibilities. And then for American Wild Horse Campaign to take on the fertility control. So we, we issue reports to them every single month. I know that Karina works hand in hand with information exchange calls coming in. Um, literally every horse that gets put down for whatever reason, it, she's reporting that back to them. They've got our numbers. Um, we are just what, working under those cooperative agreements you know, in those positions. Okay. One more question. So what authority, and this might be not just for Tracy, but what authority does a local government have over BLM management and, and, and specifically what's going on with the BLM roundups? So let's talk about that. Uh, local government and BLM roundups. I mean, they don't have, local government doesn't have authority over BLM roundups. And just to reiterate, when we're talking about BLM, we're not talking about the Virginia range. That's mostly private land, and those horses are managed by the, in, the Nevada Department of Agriculture. BLM is the public lands piece. And so that's, that's federal government level. Any more context to add to that, Council Member Dewar or Tracy? We know, that, we know how, well, how I much mean, of I a... think Tracy said it. I mean, the BLM has jurisdiction over public lands that they manage. Forest Service has jurisdiction over the lands they manage. Um, you know, we have very little BLM land within, well, none within the city of Reno uh, boundaries. There's a few odd pieces um, in South Reno on the other side, on the western side. Uh, but mostly the city of Reno ab uh, abuts or, or is far away from BLM land. Um, there is some in the north and certainly up in Sparks as well, uh, butts to some of that land. But, um, you know, these horses were designated as to be managed separately by the Nevada Department of Agriculture. Okay. Uh, Assemblyman Wheeler, you have your hand up. I have a feeling you want like to chime into to this topic. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, a lot of people in the state don't understand the difference between Virginia Range and BLM land. And uh, 
what, you know, just so everybody knows, Virginia Range is owned solely by the state or managed solely by the state, I should say, some of the, some of the uh, owned part is private land. And everything else in this state, every other wild horse is uh, managed by the BLM. So anything east of uh, the Virginia Range, for instance, south of the Virginia Range, north of the Virginia Range, all of that, all the wild horses are managed by the BLM. I know that uh, the American Wild Horse Campaign is uh, trying to deal with them right now and trying to get uh, some programs going there to stop some of the roundups. But uh, there isn't, the BLM does not work very well with the state or local governments, just so you know. Okay. Okay. Um, I am going to get, um, move to the next person we have in queue. Greg Burst, you have joined us on our panel. If you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and please take it away, sir. First off, I'd like to thank everybody for this. It's a very informative meeting. I have woken up to a fresh horse manure almost every morning for a decade and, and this is fantastic. I, I appreciate the, uh, the effort put together. Um, as, as, I, as I do this as a private citizen and things and, and while these various ideas are being implemented, what ability do we have to dissuade the horses from coming in um, to, the, to the neighborhoods and things, right? It's, it is very dangerous and, and I'm worried all the time. So are, are we allowed to shoot them with BB guns? Are we allowed, banging pots and pans does very little. What authority do we have as private citizens to, to dissuade them? Do you want to take Assemblyman Wheeler? Erica. Yeah, sorry, yes, sir, I, didn't, please. I didn't lower my hand. Uh, the, uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I know you cannot shoot them with BB guns. That's, that's considered harassment. Um, banging the pots and pans and stuff. I don't know if that would be considered harassment or not. We'd have to actually, I'd have to actually get a legal opinion on that, to be honest with you. Uh, the, uh, to dissuade them, I think is going to be more of a state and city responsibility, DOT, et cetera, all the departments that are on here listening. And I think that's what this meeting is about, trying to keep the horses out. Uh, the main thing we can do is fencing. That's, that's gonna be the main thing. And Tracy, you had an experience to share, I think it was where someone did try to shoo horses a, away from an area. And I think, could you just tell us what happened? Um... Well, we have, I'm not sure exactly which experience you're referring to, but we have. Uh, you um, mentioned an experience where a landscape person, I think, tried to shoo some horses away. Yeah, well, the, up... the biggest problem we see when somebody tries to shoo the horses away from a neighborhood, because all, all of our neighborhoods down in this area tend to feed off main thoroughfares, is that these horses take off at a run right out into the main thoroughfares and into traffic. So shooing them out of your yard helps you, but it could actually cause an accident for somebody else. So, it, it, you know, we ask that you do that carefully. Um, I think that there's a lot of individual things. I mean, Nevada's a fence out state. Now, when we get into a neighborhood with HOAs that say you can't have a fence, obviously that's a problem. And that's why we're looking at a broader fencing project. Um, on a smaller scale for an individual yard, we have people who literally just put stakes up around their yard with a rope and most of the time, not always, sometimes they'll go through it, but most of the time they will just move on to the next yard. So if you're having trouble with them coming to your specific yard, sometimes that is a deterrent that you can use. Um, and it's easy to take down when the problem no longer exists. But, it, you know, we really need to be careful about it. We had somebody shoe some horses out of a neighborhood straight onto Veterans Parkway, and that is terrifying. That's going to get somebody killed. And okay. I heard in at least one instance observed by a horse advocate that the horse, what a horse shooed by a landscaper was killed. This exact thing, they were shooing the horse off. I, I just heard that earlier today. Interesting. Okay. 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 Greg, thank you for your, um, thank you for being here with us. Thank you for your comments. And unless you have anything else, we will move along. Okay, 
Greg, thank you for that. Um, Nick, if you wouldn't mind bringing the next person in queue while you're bringing the next person in, um, I'm gonna stay in the zone of accountability. Um, questions, uh, quite a few questions, but one of the questions was, um, what, what agencies are currently budgeted to monitor the horse population and their habitats? And council member, that might be for you, I think. Well, I don't know that I'm an expert on that. I think um, uh, Assemblyman Wheeler would know more, but um, to my knowledge, the Nevada Department of Agriculture, again, is the only agency that is uh, theoretically funded. But my understanding is they haven't really been funded to do this uh, work. They've been funded, I believe, with one uh, range officer um, who is on call. And I know that the wild horse folks do call that person, but um, again, Somebody, Wheeler, do you have anything to add? Yeah, the um, uh, you're you're correct. The Department of Agriculture is the only um, state division that is uh, monitoring the horses at all, and they do that through uh, AWHC, so and uh, the other organization. But uh, that's what the uh, or I'm sorry, AWHC just does the uh, uh, darting. It's the uh, uh, I forget the name of the other one now. I must be getting old. WHC. <laughs> WHC, that's it. Uh, the Wild Horse Connection is the one who actually does that. Also, so everyone on here knows, one of the bills that I'll be putting in in the uh, next session, if I get reelected, will be uh, to actually conduct a study of the effectiveness of the PZP program and of the horses themselves. So hopefully we'll get that done here in the, uh, uh, after this next session. Thank you, sir. Okay. I did see a comment related to um, the point that there's a lot of ideas, but not necessarily a lot of concrete answers right now. This is about generating ideas and sharing what's been done and what's in, in process. And, and there are a lot of studies in process because there's a lot of learning to be done. So that's just an acknowledgement of the fact that um, it's about hearing and sharing and, and we're working on, I think the team is working on, on coming back and, and creating community informed solutions as we all as we all mentioned at the beginning. Um, Craig Downer, it looks like you've joined us. If you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and please share what you have on your mind. Okay, um, yeah, I, I've um, been very involved and concerned about the wild horse, including in the Virginia range and helped build fences there uh, for them. I've uh, studied quite a bit into this issue. I'm. Uh, wildlife ecologist and earned my master's there at UNR. Um, they're pretty um, important to me that they're, they be vital and thriving horses. Um, I'm concerned about the big emphasis on PCP because of a number of uh, detrimental effects that it has uh, both on individuals and social units and also on the long-term uh, fitness and survival of the horses and I recommend a reserve design uh, approach rather uh, and I sent you an article I wrote about why I have concerns about uh, PCP um, which I think that that all of you should take seriously into consideration because you know the horses can't speak our language and tell us what's going on. But if you observe them, there are a number of things that are very disturbing about PCP. And I think you should look at the reserve design approach. And uh, when Cameron said they were brought in by people uh, and that they have uh, serious impacts, I think he is, he is so um, misinformed there because the horses are deeply rooted natives and uh, fossil, one of, one of the most complete records uh, of fossil evidence concerns uh, the evolution of the horse family genus and species. And it's uh, their cradle is right here and, and much of it right here in, in Western uh, North America and including in Nevada. And another thing I would like to bring up is that Story County can be considered the cradle of the wild horse movement uh, in America. It was the first county to ever pass a law to protect them. And one of the main major reasons they uh, uh, passed that uh, law uh, 
I believe it's in the early 50s, was to prevent uh, wildfires. Because the Virginia City had burned down several times and they recognized uh, they're very practical people and they recognize that the horses were very valuable in that respect. So with global warming um, and, and increased uh, fires and, and more serious fires, I think uh, they should be seen as an asset. And I've written a lot about uh, or studied a lot into uh, why their um, digestive system is uh, very complementary to the ecosystem and balances out all the ruminant cloven hoofed uh, herbivores, they have, a, of course, a more thorough digestive system. And that relates to their droppings. Um, there was just a program last night about um, value of scat on the Nova series. And um, they could have mentioned that all of those in that order that the horse belongs to uh, uh, contribute greatly to the enrichment of soils and the seeding of, of a greater variety of plants as compared to the ruminant. So to me, this is a real uh, complement to the, uh, the native ecosystem, and that's how they should be seen. Now, that's about all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for providing that perspective. Really Thank appreciate you. it. With that, uh, we'll continue on. Again, please let me know if I'm having any audio issues. Um, a couple of questions, and I think Council Member Dewar, you have some thoughts on this, if you wouldn't mind. Just monitoring the fencing um, issues and concerns about uh, the fence that's being broken um, and a better barrier needs to be erected to stop vandalism. Just your thoughts and, and considerations about what, what, what we might be doing about that. Well, I mean, that's just about the toughest question. So whoever asked that, uh, kudos to you. Um, it's primarily been uh, both of the wild horse organizations and their volunteers who have been out fixing the fences. I mean, unless we go to, um, you know, look for a, a statutory violation like there is one for keeping gates closed, and actually find someone in the act, I don't know how to deal with it. And I would love to get some input from our uh, law enforcement. I mean, it's a, um, perhaps it's a private property issue, but if if we put up a fence, it's a publicly owned fence. Um, do you have any thoughts, um, Commander? No, I believe you're right on the mark. Uh, the vast majority of those fences are privately owned and, uh, are not within our, our scope of authority. Um, and definitely, uh, you know, as far as getting down there and, and providing that visibility and that education, I think is, uh, I agree with you. I think that's the, the primary, the primary track for us. My bigger concern, obviously has been mentioned throughout here that the vehicle accidents, yes, although they involve the horses, um, they more importantly involve people uh, and whether they do involve the horses or not, uh, we continue to strive to educate and enforce um, speeds uh, and driving driving habits uh, throughout our city, but especially in, in South Reno. Thank you. Um, so it's a very difficult question. These fences are at the outer boundaries of the city of Reno, right on the edge. Usually it's an area that we've annexed, approved for development, and there's a fence on the outside of it. And so there's not many eyes out there. And yet that's where the horses come in. I mean, Tracy, Karina, do you have some thoughts? This is about keeping the fences intact. You know, I think education is key. It's, I don't think it's ever gonna be 100%. You can't control everybody, right? Um, I think education is, is huge. I think, um, I think we live in a world where people have cameras in their pockets and people cutting fences should probably be careful. But, you know, I had one, I, we just put together a fence and flagged it for NDOT to repair that somebody cut directly next to a sign that said wild horses keep fences intact. I, I don't know what the answer there is. I, I wish I did, but, you know, I think in our local community area, education is a huge piece to this. 
let's just stay there for a quick second. There's a question related to um, just in the same kind of area. What happens when a developer does not fence appropriately? Um, Jackie, that might be a question for you. Again, just a, related to accountability and enforcement fencing. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for the question. So certainly whenever developers have their projects approved, it's in a series of stages. So it might be the tentative map and then it might have a few other pieces along the way before it's completely done. And at the earliest possible stage of approval, uh, the city will may and often does require fencing. If the developer does not tend to the fence, put up the fence or allow it to um, get broken and doesn't fix it, there are various actions that the city can take with respect to that developer. Um, they cannot approve the next permit. They can do other criteria around um, following up and uh, additional stop work orders, for example. Eventually, when the project is built, it's typical that the fence be turned over to be managed by the association. And at that point, again, the city would have some enforcement abilities should not, that not be handled appropriately. It looks like Council Member Dewar might have some additional words. No, you hit it on the mark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jennifer Baker, you have joined us from Q. If you would unmute yourself and please share us share with us what's on your mind. Hi, there was a, a couple of things that were mentioned about just if the if the wild horse connection AWHC is responsible for if the horses had caused damage somewhere. I just want to clarify three points if it's okay and they'll be very quick. One, um, these are wild horse experts. There was a couple questions about why would we have nonprofits managing this. Um, I'm a huge fan of them coming from the state side. Um, I can tell you that there was a review of who gets the management um, applications passed and why. And when they um, applied, it was looked at as they were the experts. They actually have experts in the horse field period that, that work with these organizations. They're not responsible for something a horse does. They don't own the horses. The state of Nevada owns these horses. So at the end of the day, what they're doing is creating solutions repeatedly for things that most people don't wanna do because they truly love these horses and they wanna make sure that they're safe and well taken care of. And I think that um, we all should probably just tell them thank you for that. I hate to say it in that way, but these are nonprofit people that show up in the middle of the night, in the middle of the weekends, in the middle of holidays to go and help horses, which I think is great. And, and we appreciate that more often than you think when the horse is in your front yard with broken leg and you're having to deal with it, you have a phone number to call as a solution. So I just wanted to, that was point one. Um, the other thing was the, the broken fences. Somebody was saying that it was their responsibility. At the end of the day, it's whoever owns the property. That's their responsibility to one, put a camera up and make sure that somebody's not vandalizing something on their own property. And I would like to see more of those um, people do that. I'm being careful what I say right now, but if it's on your property, it's your responsibility. And that's kind of just a given in, the, in America as a whole. So it's not Wild Horse Connection or American Wild Horse's responsibility to repair the fence. But once again, we circle back to, they're the ones out there doing it in the mud, the, in the snow, in the rain. Um, in really bad conditions and um, along roadsides where they're putting literally their lives at risk. So once again, these are volunteers that are out there doing things that most of us don't want to do and won't do. So um, just kind of give them credit. Yes, they are experts in what they do, which is great, but they're out there as volunteers. So let's at least be kind to them and understand sort of where they are, where they fit into this puzzle piece of of challenges that we have in our community. And then the last thing is, I just think um, we all need to, to thank everybody that's on here. You guys have done a really good job this time. This is the second one of a consortium style that we all got into. And I really love the, the listening. I love how much you guys are showing that you care about the community and what's happening out here. I wrote several written notes of different things. I'm sure you'll go through those. I don't wanna waste the time, but I did wanna verbalize those pieces because I saw that pop up several times in the comments. Just understand that these are, these are nonprofit organizations that the state awarded these contracts 
for a reason though, because they are the experts who truly care and will show up no matter what, come whatever the weather conditions are. So you guys, thank you for all you do. Naomi, thank you for continuing to support them. And for all of you guys that are on this showing you care about our community, we just appreciate you because this is a, a long time coming. Lots of, of different meetings where we've said, hey, we have a, a lot of problems out here. We need somebody to care about the loss of life and the loss of quality of life and the loss of property out here. So we just really appreciate all of you for the time. Sorry for the interruption. Well, it's not an interruption, Jennifer, and I have a question for you. I mean, you're active in the space too. I know you're supporting the various um, nonprofits. Mm -hmm. I mean, what what's your take on the proposal for um, some more extensive fencing? Oh, that's a um, something that, that has been a challenge for a long time in that area. Um, most of the other developments have their areas fenced off, but a lot of times there were challenges with the type of fence or the way it was put in. This area particularly has needed a fence and, and Tracy could probably speak to it best, but I've been helping in this space at some capacity for um, almost two decades. So I can tell you that area has needed fencing for a long time, both the community. So I work a lot with the community just as a whole, getting the feedback when they're upset. And then also from the, the horse advocate side, I'll just be careful saying it, but um, that area has needed fencing so badly for so long. And it is a large part of these horses coming onto the roadways over the last year that were tragic. Thanks so much. Back to you, Erica. Awesome. Jennifer, thank you so much. Um, we will bring the next person in, Nick, if you wouldn't mind. And while we're doing that, Tracy, there's been a handful of questions related to the effectiveness of PZP, as well as the cost. If you could just generally um, sort of speak to that, that would be great. Hi. Okay. Um, the effectiveness, as I said in my presentation, it's about 97% effective when administered you know, the way they're trained, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, the, the, vol the volunteer darters are all trained. They, they're certified. Um, there is, uh, it's, it's highly effective when administered. Just to give you a little background, uh, when you're starting out a mare, she gets a primer and then anywhere from two weeks to a couple months later, she gets a booster. And after that, it's in, you know, anywhere from eight to 12 months, but generally once a year on that booster. For the first, you know, several years, it's reversible. We can stop it and the mayor will go back to being able to have a baby again. We saw that happen when the program was stopped. You know, those mayors went on to go start having babies again. So we know that happens. Um, as far as the cost, and I was so afraid someone was going to ask this because I'm looking through my notes and I, so please don't quote me as hard rock here, but I believe we're at about $37 a shot for the supplies. Remember, we have an all volunteer team out there. So they're out there on their, um, you know, on their time doing that. They're not getting paid for their time out there. So um, obviously there's some equipment costs, that type of thing. But it, overall, it's, it's um, I got to tell you, it's a lot more cost efficient than millions of dollars in helicopters for roundups, which is what they're doing out on BLM land. Okay. Thanks, Tracy. Nancy, thank you for joining us. I see you're off mute. Uh, please grab the mic and share what's on your mind. Uh, are you able to hear me now? Yes, we are. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I live out in Washoe Valley. I don't know if you're going to have any future uh, meetings regarding wild horses out in Washoe Valley. If you are, I'm, I will keep my remarks to that meeting. Otherwise, I needed to ask a question. I can take that. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, what is your question? And if I can't answer it on behalf of the Washoe Valley representatives then I, I'm, or uh, Washoe County reps, we will uh, take the question and get you an answer. Oh, okay. Well. I've lived out in the valley for 42 years, uh, and it's only been in about the last five that I've had to contend with the wild horses coming in and near my property. I do fence them out. I have my own horses that I ride and also some that I take care of, you know, of my own that are older, but I don't ride them anymore. 
And I don't have it frequently, but I do have mares um, and studs come in from the park. And I did not used to have this problem at all. And, uh, and just last week, uh, I had to go out and run them off because they were fighting with my horses um, through the fence. I did call the Wild Horse Connection. I did not get an answer back from them. If I can't run them off myself, I'm concerned about the safety of my own horses and what I can actually do to prevent that. And as I said, this is a more recent issue for me and uh, I'd like to know what recourse I have. Go ahead, Tracy. Um, well, I just wanna say, especially down in your area, you can absolutely shoo them off your property as long as you're not shooing them onto a busy street. Um, I think that I was trying to make that clear in my previous point. Um, I've been down in some of those Washoe Valley neighborhoods and by all means, you can you can shoo them off those private property um, and, and, you know, discourage them from coming your direction. Um, is, I, I, can you, did that answer your question or do you have more? Not, not completely. Um, uh, what I'm concerned about is if I'm not here uh, and those horses come in and they do come up and down the streets and, and you know, walk into neighborhoods. They can't get onto my property because I have gates and I have fences, but they will fight over the fences with my horses. Um, like I said, they, uh, they're out in the park. I've talked to the Department of Agriculture. They said that it's, I, and I've talked to the state park also. And of course they send me to the Wild Horse Connection because they do have the cooperative agreement with the Department of Agriculture. Um, I'm not quite sure what my recourse is here to keep my horses from being hurt. Nancy, I just have a question. We're, we're not gonna know the full answer to your question, but I do have a question for you. How big is your property? Five acres. Five acres. But okay. where my horses are, um, they're not on that whole five acres. I have a half acre on one end and I have about, a half acre up in the front. So right now, the wild horses can only get to two of my horses. Yeah. But one's a mare, and when the studs are running up and down the streets, then I have troubles. And they also were fighting with my old gelding. And this is over the fence. This is over the fence. Yeah, I will tell you, this might be very out of the box, and it's, it's not probably a right answer, but if it was me and my property, what I might do is string a second line of fence inside the first one just to create a little <clears> bit of space. I know that might sound crazy and there's an expense there, but I'm just saying, you know, we see, I have the same problem, but with my dogs, my dogs are barking with the dogs next door and, um, you know, to, to potentially create some separation might be a, a double fence, but that might be too expensive. It's just a kind of an out of the box thinking, and I don't know that it's any kind of right answer. So thank you for that, Naomi. I'm going to go ahead and jump in here. I do have your phone number and you are on my list to call. I have a couple of suggestions for you. And I also wanted to see if I can come out and do a site visit. So if you don't mind, um, probably tomorrow or Saturday, I can reach out to you personally and we can set up a visit so we can go over the planning of your property and see how we can help you out with that. That would be great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Karina. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you for being here. Nancy, if that covers it, we will bring the next person in queue, Nick, please. And while we are, um, there was a question related to cameras and fencing. Um, and if that's something that we potentially could consider as it relates to enforcement, again, just a lot of questions about enforcement. Um, Council Member Dewar, we might have answered that a little bit, but any clarifications well, on that piece? The, the only part of it that I will address is about the cameras. I personally think that in particularly challenging areas such as the Rio Wrangler Gate, we need to install a camera. It's been too much damage and destruction. I know the gate is in the process of being reconstructed or, or will be soon, let's say over the next 30 days, uh, reconstructed and installed. But what I'm worried about is then the next vehicle that comes and knocks down the gate. So, you know, we, we have to take some kind of action, um, you know, to identify what is going on there. Is, is it uh, and who it is and ask, you know, get them to stop. I mean, and I don't know how to do that in this day and age without, let's say, a camera. 
Okay, so safe to say that it's in the consideration list as we're thinking yeah. about solutions. Okay, well, awesome. I think it ranks high and I think we need to discuss it internally for sure. Awesome. Um, there are the top three questions we have in queue right now, or excuse me, in the, in the Q and A list, all deal with development, um, placing fees on, uh, fees on developers, um, why we didn't issue permits or did we maybe issue permits? Um, and why are we developing on uh, range land? So Jackie, I, I know this goes into development territory, but maybe you have some high points that you could share with the group. Yeah, as to the high, the high points is that, as you've heard, the Virginia range is private land. And so developers have a right to develop on their land consistent with the criteria uh, that the city and Washoe County might place upon them. We do not have a development expert on this uh, panel tonight, but given the high number of questions related to development, I think it would behoove us to have one at our next meeting for sure. Um, what was the other specific question? Let me see if I can answer it. Why didn't planners have a plan in place prior to issuing permits for all the houses and apartments? Let's wait for, for a uh, planner to, to be here for that. And Council Member Dorr may have something to add. Yeah, I'll just okay. say that one approach that we could take and it has been taken by other communities is to do something called an area plan. And I think that's maybe what this question is getting at. Um, first of all, development happens, as, as uh, Jackie said, on property when, a when an owner of a property wants to develop it in some way. I mean, it may be dense, it may be um, lightly, but it's their right to put forward a development consistent with the zoning and the master plan. So there's an overlay. The question is, should we do some planning kind of on a regional basis? Um, I'm inspired by the fact that the legislature enacted an ordinance to deal with wildlife in general, and that uh, going forward permits or, or proposals that are in this area between what's developed now and, and what we might call um, open land, green land, wild land uh, will be evaluated for impacts. And my understanding is that Endow um, we'll be working with developers um, to evaluate their mitigation plan. So if their development is going to impact, uh, whether it's a mule deer, uh, a bear, a horse, um, they will recommend mitigation measures or they will evaluate mitigation measures that the developer proposes. So, um, you know, if that's something you're concerned about, whoever asked this question, you, you need to write in and let us know, you know, what your concerns are. and and stay involved in the community when development proposals come up. The city's come up with them, an amazing new tool dating back to last January, where every two weeks, roughly, they come out with a list, a really easy to read list. It's called uh, Development Projects or Community Development. You can just go on um, reno.gov and look, search for newsletters and click the box and you'll get notice of this. And it tells you all of the bigger uh, developments being proposed, who, who it, where it is, who's working on it, what phone numbers you can contact, how to stay involved. And really that would be my best advice to anyone. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Tina, you've joined us. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking yourself off mute, thank you for being here. And when you're ready, we'd love to hear what your comments or suggestions might be. And if you're still on mute, I'm sorry, but I didn't have a comment. I was just listening. Oh, oh okay. Your hand is up and we, oh. we thought you had something, to, something no. to say. So no problem. That's okay. Sorry okay. for putting you on the spot. Thanks for being here. And we'll, we'll move you back into a silent mode. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Melanie, it looks like you have joined us. If you can hear me. Oh, she's just gone away. We'll give uh, Nick a couple minutes to bring some folks back. Um, while Melanie's getting settled, there are a couple questions here related to the grassy medians. And is there anything we can do to, um, I guess, not have them because they lure horses? So comments on that. Um, I think that a simple answer is yes. Um, I think that that proposal, you know, we're, we're gathering information here and that is certainly something Jackie is over the development services that she could bring back as a proposed condition for these 
uh, areas that are being built again at the urban wildland interface so that we don't draw horses in. I will say that the big solution, um, bigger than medians, bigger than speed limits, bigger than lighting, is keeping the horses out of the developments with the fencing. Um, at least that's what I'm hearing. But I, I do think, especially when the grassy areas are near gates, such as the Rio Wrangler gate, probably that grass should probably come out. And that's something I'm willing to um, talk to the Landscape Maintenance Association over there about. Awesome. Thank you for that. We have, uh, in addition to Melanie, who's just joined us, we have two more people in queue. So looking at the time, we'll take Melanie and the two other folks that are that are um, also in line. So uh, just to know that. Melanie, I see you're off mute. Thank you for being here. Please share with us what's on your mind, suggestions, solutions, questions. Uh, hi, thanks for uh, taking me. Um, I uh, wanted to make a a couple of comments. Um, one of them is about dark skies. Uh, I moved here 31 uh, years ago, and I love being able to see the stars. I'm in the Virginia Foothills area. Um, and I also love the horses. Um, and I've been reading a lot lately, and I understand that preserving dark skies not only preserves the star, the star, the the view of the stars for the residents, but it also preserves the habitat for a number of species. And we also have um, at Redfield campus, which is just across the freeway from me, uh, we have uh, an astronomy complex. Um, with uh, uh, two observatories. So I am very interested in preserving the dark skies. I would, of course, if if there's any broken lights, we should we should fix them. Um, but um, any movement to get additional lighting simply for the horses, I think is misguided. One, because the problem is not so much the lighting um, as uh, Mr. Flansberg said, uh, the horse's uh, hair absorbs light, it's non-reflective. So you may not be able to see them anyway. And horses also like deer, like rabbits, they just run in front of cars. Uh, they don't have the capacity to understand traffic. So there's kind of a double, um, uh, uh, there's an issue there with um, horses running in front of cars, people not being able to see them because they're, um, they're non-reflective. So the lights wouldn't necessarily help in my opinion. Um, and um, had another, uh, one of the, uh, a gentleman mentioned that he thought that uh, horses here are, are completely an invasive species, but at the beginning of the meeting, Corinna Vance was saying that um, the horses have been here for at least 30,000 years, and the evidence is that fossils have been found. And currently, the, um, the uh, genetics of the horses are so intermixed that there's kind of no way to tell right now. And I just want to know if I got that wrong or not. Um, so in other words, horses are not an invasive species, but they have been here for several, many thousand years. And one more last question, I'm not sure who would be the first, would be the correct person to answer it, but um, if if grassy areas such as the median in Veterans Parkway, and also I just want to mention that I drive Veterans Parkway constantly because I go to work uh, going that way. Um, why is there grass everywhere? If it's a buffet for horses, is there something that can be done to uh, with the um, agreements that we make with developers to have grassy medians, uh, which are also taking a lot of water? Um, uh, perhaps some sort of a zero scaping uh, would be preferable. And thank you. I, I think we could answer a couple of those. I'll unmute I think, myself. And I think some of them are longer term issues. Just I'm going to take a couple from the end. Uh, the buffet for horses, well said. Um, I think what the city, in terms of uh, supporting the soil, we would rather see trees than grass. Trees are pretty challenging down in South, South Reno, Reno because, because of uh, boron and other minerals in the soil and the water, but there are some species that grow well. 
but a lot of people use rock mulch that tends to increase the heat as well. So as an alternative, we would probably be looking at some kind of more organic mulch, like ground up bark, that kind of thing. Um, it actually helps, it's cooler than rock and grass is cooler yet, because as you point out, it's using water and it's evapotranspiring. And so it keeps things cool. So it does provide a use. It's not just all aesthetic, but it does provide, it does use water. Um, there's some others you, you asked. Um, I think more of the stuff you said was maybe more comments that we, that we need to take into consideration about the dark skies, um, the invasive species and so on. So thank you so much for your comments and your thoughts. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I'm going to mute myself now. <laughs> I think it's back to you, Erica. Thank you. Give me just you. Give me one just moment. And while we wait for Erica, let's see if you can move the next person in. Nick, please. Thank you, Jackie. Hopefully you can hear me now of just having a, a Murphy's Law with my Wi-Fi. Perfect. No Roger. Awesome. Roger, thank you for being with us. It looks like you're here. If you wouldn't mind, please coming off of mute. Hello. Thank you so much. Okay, my first question is, is why are there so many studies necessary to reduce speed limits, thereby making it safer for the public? Um, that is the first major concern. Um, the second major concern that I have is what is being done as far as in relation to these development permits, do you require endangered species and plant identification studies prior to allowing these development permits to continue and get approved, okay? This, the third thing is very simply, I see everybody boasting about this PZP program, but yet they seem to blow right over the negative effects it has based on studies done by Oxford University. The negative effects based on fact from their studies show that mares are unable to ovulate after three years of consistent treatment. Okay, so those are very three very simple questions um, and we'll leave it at that. Thank you, Roger. It's, uh, Jackie, go ahead. I was gonna pitch to John on speed limits. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, so when, when a, a road goes in, there's typically a speed limit that it, the road is designed for. Um, but the road goes in, uh, speed limit can go up, but we don't just arbitrarily lower or raise speed limits. Um, it's actually based on a percentage of the vehicles and the speed that they feel comfortable driving certain roadways. Um, and it's also based on, on other factors um, it could be uh, if we the number of accidents or other other items that may come up. So Roger, to your question, I I, I totally get it. Um, it's like, well, if you if you think if lowering speeds is going to make it more safe, then let's just lower the speed. Um, it, there's there's actually a, a very prescribed process that we have to go through to make sure that we're not just being arbitrary and setting speed limits because um, you know one person's lower speed limit is somebody else's speed trap. Um, and so we just have to make sure that we that everything falls in line and, and, uh, and that they're signed and striped and all the other traffic controls that go with that. So appreciate the question. Well, it has nothing to do with setting a speed trap. I mean, I've driven through the area multiple times and I get past like I'm backing up doing the speed limit. And, and, and I'm only saying that if we lower a speed limit arbitrarily, then then well, you're, it's not arbitrarily. It's for safety of not only the people, but of the wildlife. Yeah, so that's that's why there's a there's a prescribed process we go through to show that we're not being arbitrary and raising or lowering speed limits. Well, yeah, but your arbitrariness to lowering the speed limit is causing not only loss of property from vehicles, but also loss of life from our, our children's resources.
Um, yeah, Mr. Absolutely. Dobson, I will take your next question um, related yes, to development, yeah. endangered species and plants. Um, the master plan that we adopted, it's called Reimagine Reno. It has an entire section about um, where urban and wildland come together. It, it's about um, endangered and threatened species, and it's also about fire. Um, so development has to be consistent with the master plan. We may or may not have a specific law about it uh, or regulation, it's called an ordinance, but they definitely look to the master plan. And I'll give you an example. Um, just last week, a developer came in and it was actually the Natural Heritage Program identified that there was a not threatened, not endangered, but species of concern on the property, meaning it doesn't have any federal or state type protection. In fact, there is not a state law anyway. Um, but that it was a species of concern that only 14 areas existed with that species. Um, the public um, supported the Natural Heritage Program, which is a program of the state to identify and try to protect species and help them not become endangered or threatened. So the public um, wrote in and said this area really should be developed, uh, excuse me, protected from development. And uh, the developer actually voluntarily agreed to pull his homes back from those areas and at my request uh, to fence the area during construction and after construction and put up signage, educational signage about the species. In that same development, um, uh, we're, we're separately working on a tree ordinance and a lot of the trees were to be cut down on site there and Jeffrey Pines, which grow very well in that area without any kind of irrigation, just native. and. Um, that developer agreed to pull back from virtually, I would say 90, 95% of all of the trees and move the houses. There isn't a requirement to do that, nor is there one proposed, but those are, those are examples of how, um, even if there is not a specific ordinance, we can work with developers to address these issues. You know, you may um, prefer to have a more specific ordinance, and that's certainly something that you should write in about. Again, the NDAO review is about animals or wildlife, or birds, it's not about plants at this point. But again, Natural Heritage does advise our staff about those issues. And I think the third one was for Tracy about PZP. Yeah, I mean, I think the best answer I can have is that fertility control for wild horses is a hot topic with a lot of emotion involved. Um, well, there's no emotion, it's based on science. We look at uh, the options that are available. The option to do nothing is not something we can do on an ever shrinking range. So, you know, rounding them up and shipping them to the livestock auction to be shipped across the border for slaughter is not something we consider to be humane. Um, of, the, of the fertility control available, we find PZP to be the least harmful. And we uh, have actually not seen some of the things that you said, though I did tag your it's the article Oxford that you study. posted. Excuse me? It's in Oxford study. Uh, okay. I, again, I just, as I was saying, I, I tagged it and I will read it later, but um, I'm just speaking for what we're doing now in that um, compared to the other options available, this is the, as far as we're concerned, this is the most humane and the least harmful to the animals. Okay, so we're, we're going to add one more question. Initially, when you did your introduction, you claimed that the public was not paying you yet. Then you said you were operating under grants. Well, grants come from us, the public. Not all grants. Some grants come from private foundations, and that's actually where most of our grants come from. Is it? Okay. It is. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Dobson. A lot of really great questions and a lot of work to be done as well. So hopefully that, that gets some ideas addressed. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. We have one more person in queue. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Nick, bringing that individual in. And I just want to um, take one question while, that, uh, while we're getting that next and last person in. A few questions about why um, gate and why not a cattle guard? or cattle guards. Um, so just a, just a question on that. Stracy, that's you, thank you. If, if that is relating directly to the Rio Wrangler gate question, the reason is there is actually a cattle guard there. 
when you drive through that gate, the ground goes up. And so when we have storms and with all the big trucks, um, and when I say big trucks, I'm talking about the, the four wheel drive vehicles going in and out there, it actually fills that cattle guard in on a pretty regular basis with dirt. As, as, as volunteers, we've actually been out there and cleaned that thing out by hand several times. But once you get a big storm come in that fills it in, it's almost impossible to keep up because of the way it's set into the ground there with the ground going up away from it. And that's private property beyond there. So it's not something we can go in there and grade. Got it. Awesome. Thanks. That's super helpful. Um, Amy, it looks like you're here. It's, you're here with us. You, if you can hear me, just take yourself off mute and we love you to join the conversation. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, this is Amy at the Reno Gazette Journal. I had a quick question for Councilwoman Deer. Um, I was wondering if she could elaborate on um, possible um, condition amendments for permit developments in the South Reno area that she alluded to. And also um, she mentioned possibly increasing enforcement and adding fines. And I was wondering if she could elaborate on that. And then uh, I just also didn't know if you guys had um, a potential date yet for the May meeting or how people would be, um, uh, I guess, notified about it. Thank you. Um, we'll take it in reverse order, I believe. And let me get confirmation that we tentatively have planned the May meeting for a Monday, May 16th. Is that correct, Jackie? That's correct. Okay. Um, number two, uh, about the conditions. So. I want to say it was about a year ago that the Wild Horse Connection and basically Tracy um, actually appealed a permit. And she appealed it because she felt that the conditions that were appended to the permit did not adequately address um, protection of wildlife, but specifically horses. And um, as a result of that, she met with the developers and they worked to come up with eight conditions. And the city felt that the eight conditions, which had to do with, and Tracy can explain it more, had to do with uh, fencing, uh, when it would go in, how it would be maintained, the time frame within which it would be maintained. Um, those conditions, uh, the city decided to adopt last January as part of their Title 18 update. So they became standard conditions for projects in these areas. Um, in terms of enforcement, I think that Jackie Bryan has already addressed it, but just to reiterate, um, we take the, the permits very seriously. And if uh, we get a report that someone is not implementing their permit consistent with their conditions, then we have a, a compliance and enforcement staff that will go and check it out. And I've seen it happen over and over. Many residents will call me or call into uh, Reno Direct uh, to say, they don't think someone's doing something right, or they've been tracking a permit and they didn't do an X before they did a Y, um, or they didn't post the notice correctly or whatever it might be. And I report those with the help of my liaison who was on this call, um, Nick, uh, into Reno Direct. And then the city has a team to evaluate uh, the actual report and decide what to do. It could be a code enforcement issue like, one of the number one ones that we get is an abandoned vehicle. It's in every single ward. Abandoned vehicle and the team, and I think Jackie heads up that team, is what to do, how to prioritize those issues. We also have Ashley Turney on here, and she, to my knowledge, is a, in charge of our Reno Direct at this time. And so they highlight issues that are repetitive um, examples. Um, and then in terms of fines, you asked, um, we, have, we generally seek compliance. I mean, that's our goal is we want people to do what they say and do what they commit to. The permit is a legal document. So if they are not, uh, we need to give them that nudge. Um, in terms of fining, the only fines that I've seen levied prior to this are to do with um, violations of our code, such as you got a permit and it required that you plant so many trees and uh, 40 years later, you cut down those trees. Uh, we have been look, taking a closer look at the dollar figure for those fines, and is it commensurate with the incident? Um, so that's, I hope I've answered all of your questions. I don't know if, uh, if I have or if, if uh, Jackie has anything to add. 
He did. I actually just thought of one more really quick one. Sure. It's just a clarification. At the beginning, you said there was an increase of 15,000 vehicles and 15,000 people in the South Reno area. Is that right. 15,000 total people and cars, or is it 15,000 vehicles and 15,000 cars? Well, um, the both are estimates. We just did a redistricting process, and uh, Ward 2, my ward, had grown by 15,000 people. And I know where the growth areas have been pretty much in South Reno. There's been an occasional development during that time with maybe 40 homes here or 20 homes there, but the bigger developments have been um, down in South Reno. So it's a rough estimate. Um, many homes have an average of two and a half to three people. Um, many, uh, some of those people are kids, but some of those people are teenagers who drive or adults who drive. And so also a number of people have multiple cars. Um, so those numbers are a rough estimate based on the recent census and where the where we experienced the growth in the city of Reno, which was all documented uh, by precinct area through the census. So they're very rough numbers. Uh, maybe I should have caveated it to uh, 10 to 15,000 in South Reno, uh, just to make sure I'm in the range, but uh, it's pretty close. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks for those great questions. Great, great questions. Okay. Um, we're going to wrap it up. We promised to make sure that we ended around the 730 hour. So let's do that. Um, a lot of information and thoughts related to speeding, fertility, NRS, actually, which was great clarification. Some, you know, sharing, thank you so much on the fencing ideas as well. Um, agency responsibility, there's a lot of agencies involved in, in how this works. So the issues are not straightforward, nor are they easy. So um, I'm gonna just bring up a slide just to uh, put on everyone's radar a couple of things. And then Councilwoman Dewar, I'll ask you to, to close us out officially. So just some, some notes and some comments to, to have for everybody. We're looking towards the second community meeting on May 16th, you heard that, but just to put that in front of everybody, I'm looking for a, a draft plan of sorts in the fall. So Councilwoman Dewar, you can speak to that. The wild horse outline is super important. Um, please note that number down for, uh, for any horses that are in need. And I know Tracy and Karina would really like to make sure that everybody knows that number. And then to stay apprised of what's happening with this issue, reno.gov forward slash um, horses. So that's all the information um, you need to have about this issue and to stay, stay connected. Again, this will be posted and we didn't get to all of the questions. We got to almost all of them, but we'll make sure that we bring um, any more topics forward uh, to make sure again, that we focus on community uh, generated solutions. So with that, Councilwoman Dewar. Sure. Um, do you wanna take down the screen share or get, leave it up so people can get the information either way? Um, I just wanna thank everyone for coming and uh, the presenters did a fantastic job I'm so grateful um, that they are on it and on point. I'm very grateful for the interagency cooperation between NDOT, the county, and the city. I mean, uh, no man is an island, no woman can do it alone, right? So we need that cooperation and, and we need to stick together in order to solve the regional problem as I think John did an excellent job of identifying that this is a regional problem. Um, I also wanna note that the things that we've been doing to date have not been that costly. So putting up some warning signs, uh, changing speed limits on Rio Wrangler and Steamboat Parkway. Um, they've been pretty much, you know, doing some extra patrols. All of that has been absorbed in our day-to-day -day budgets that the city has. These kind of next steps, if it's a fence, if it's um, horse guards, if it is overpasses or underpasses, if it's a, a corridor, if it's a preserve, all of these are going to cost more money. They're more like capital improvement projects. And we've got a budget for those things. Um, sometimes there's, a, there's always a contingency budget that the city has for emergencies. But, and it looks like there's funds from the federal government. But I think that's why it's incredibly important to have this meeting and that, that we had tremendous participation from the public when we've gathered um, ideas We've, we've gathered your feelings about things, what you might support, what you might not support. And I think it gives the um, all of the team members here an opportunity to go back and really think through 
what is the best approach? Where do we go from here? Um, but I will tell you, we have heard you loud and clear. Um, I have received letters. I'm confident that Commissioner Lucy has received letters. Um, our staff have received letters. And there's been public testimony that it's it's time for the city, the county, and NDOT to take the next step. And um, so we have heard you. Um, and I really think we have to roll up our sleeves and kind of go to the next level in terms of the more challenging things to do. So again, I thank you so much for taking time out of your evening, um, almost two and a half hours with us tonight, um, listening to the pre presentations, asking such good questions. So a, a huge thanks uh, to everyone who came, to again, to our media partners, uh, to our elected officials that participated, and to our staff that really made this happen. Uh, we, uh, the electeds, could not have done this without your great support. So thank you so much. And um, with that, I think we'll sign off for the evening. If you have additional questions, comments, you can always send those into the city. Uh, there's, a, there's a public comment at uh, reno.gov is one way. You can also send public comment to the county. You, uh, the county reps mentioned a 311 number. We have the Reno Direct number, which I hope I have right, is 344-4636. That's 344-4636 or 344-INFO. Um, check out the website. I'll reiterate that. Look for our messaging and also give us feedback. If you see some actions starting to take place, let us know what you think about those actions. Um, also, I'm going to ask Erica and the team to put together a list of the people that were on here so that we can inform you of the next meeting. We have your emails now that you've signed on to Zoom, so we can start a list and, and keep you in the know. Uh, with that, that's my final words. Thank you again.